thanks to everybody for attending and uh, we're delighted to have such a great crowd um we, we just had some technical issues with um on really sadly with dr catherine o'hara's talk um there was a, there was a problem making a screen connection uh, and we, we we may be able to get to her um in about a half an hour or so but we're, we're going to wait and see how that works out um now make sure that your microphone is mute i think you're probably muted anyway to reduce any noise while the lecturers speak uh, the talk is going to be recorded so um that's going to be shown on the prony youtube channel so if you don't want to appear in the video do make sure your camera is turned off um now, this event is a collaboration between the Linen Biennale, an annual celebration of the linen industry in Northern Ireland, and PRONI, the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland. The Linen Biennale, some months ago, offered us for display during the month of October a beautiful and thought-provoking exhibition created by the Scottish artist Lynn Hocking. Um, we could only try and match this offer by putting together a seminar that would do justice to it. Now, we've asked Dr. Catherine O'Hara to speak on research she's carried out on industrial design, and that's the talk that unfortunately we have technical issues with. But we're also contributing something on our own part by launching a new updated guide to textile sources in Prony. Now, Robert Martin of the Linen Biennale is going to open the seminar by speaking about the progress and meaning of the project in recent years. Uh, Lynn Hawking will then speak to interpret the installation currently on show in Prony. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of Prony to launch the textile guide, the uh, Prony textile guide. And there's there's a possibility that Dr. O'Hara will be able to speak then, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Now, we should have time for questions after the talks. Put comments and questions for the different speakers onto the chat facility and we'll pick them up at that point. So we'll kick off with some words from Robert. Hi, everybody. Um, 20 minute wait um, is not bad because this has been a nine year journey for the Linen Biennale. So 20 minutes is, is minuscule. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, I'm a co-founder of the Linen Biennale, uh, which I say kicked off with a feasibility study in 2015, funded by the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. Then the British Council came on board and the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, <clears throat> where we were able to complete the 2018 Linen Biennale, uh, which was a, a great partnership with Prony, especially. We had um, uh, uh, Professor Jane McCann working with us, who's a technical textile expert uh, and has a worldwide um, knowledge of, of textiles and also uh, the fashion industry so we had a fashion show at the at prony in 2018 which is great success etc etc this has all been possible through the, this year especially through the heritage national lottery heritage fund and the the play, the players of the national lottery so we have to big credit to them for supporting us and our program um we we started with the theme past present and future because the way we see that linen it's coming back in fashion if that's what you want to call it uh, and again with professor jane mccann looking at uh, at composite materials in in involving uh, flax and linen um so great credit to jane mccann first of all and also this year uh, uh, we were able to have a project man manager, Maeve McElvoy, uh, which you know, which has been a, a great help to us to pull off uh, what this year has been even better than 2018, dare I say it. So now we're looking for the future. Can we keep this going every two years? And that's the issue that we've got. So I hope, well, talking about Lynn's, uh, Lynn's excellent exhibition uh intergeneration connections that has been absolutely perfect for prony to deliver and it's it, if you get a chance those who are in northern ireland to visit it i recommend it before it finishes um i'll just close there actually desmond you're muted desmond yeah okay i'm unmuted now um thanks very much uh, robert um 
Okay, I, I'm really looking forward to Lynn's uh, discussion of the exhibit. Uh, everyone loves it. Um, it's it, it really is a sort of, it's a meditative exhibit and it, it's very, very pretty um, and enjoyable. So um, work away, Lynn. Hi, thank you so much, um, Des and Robert, for the invitation to join you tonight. It's coming up as a slideshow. Thank you. And and first up, uh, apologies. I am nursing some form of lurgy, which is um, having at my voice. So I'm hoping to be able to make it through to the end of these uh, slides this evening. Um, I just wanted to really give a bit of an overview of the exhibition that is currently on at Prony and um, how it links in with the themes and topics under discussion as part of the, the Linen Biennale, you know, making those links between Scotland and, and Ireland, but also how it links into the function of Prony as a public records office. Um, so first off, um, a bit about me. This is one of the pieces in the exhibition with the human human for scale. See me lying in the bottom of it. So if those of you are not able to get to Prony in, in Belfast to have a look at it, hopefully this will give you a sense of what it is that you're seeing on the on the coming screens. I um, started off my career working as a scientist, uh, um, an academic researcher, working in the field of human genetics. Um, trying to understand um, the causes predominantly of uh, disorders affecting um, bones and joints and then trying to understand, trying to make sense at a kind of a cellular and systems level of what changes in genetic information we're actually doing within the body, which is quite a big departure from uh, from what I'm doing now and, and what I'm going to be to talk to you about. But back in 2015, I decided to leave that job um, and spent the following most of the following year traveling around the world with my family and rekindled a really long standing interest in, in textiles that I'd very much picked up at the knees of my mother and a grandmother growing up. And it was while I was traveling that I learned to weave for the first time, having never had any skills or knowledge of that as a practice. Or then other than what you might have done with kind of strips of paper or perhaps kind of cardboard strung with yarn at school. Um, I learned to weave on a jungly terrace in northern Thailand and was taught by two women who didn't speak very much English and I didn't speak any Thai and it was a really wonderful experience in how hand skills can be transferred between humans through action. Um, shared repetitive actions and through the the um, through observing, correcting and and repeating. And while I was weaving there, I very quickly could see the potential for links between data and information and systems of encoding those within the way that weaving works, where you have a warp that is stretched from. Uh, warp, uh, stretched threads held under tension. You can see some of those here at the front of this image that are running from the sort of cylinder at the, the front up towards that top beam of this house structure. Um, and then you're intersecting that with, uh, with weft yarns to create fabric. And very quickly, I landed on the idea of actually trying to represent genetic information within the fabrics that I was weaving. And what you're seeing here is a detail of one of the pieces in the exhibition it is actually some of my own genetic information that I've used to set up the loom. So the actual weave structure itself, the way that the loom is set up takes genetic information in how the warp threads are attached onto the loom. And then the way that the weft intersects with this is also specified by those four letter um, of A's, C's, G's and T's that you may or may not be familiar with. So the pattern within the fabric is then unique to the DNA sequence that underpins it. And this was really kind of started my journey in weaving and thinking about how I could bring together information with weaving practice and create fabrics to tell stories about that information and data. 
And then that really morphed into something more substantial as my journey progressed. I didn't know it at the time I started weaving, but I actually come from a very long line of weavers in Scotland. Um, I knew that my mum and dad had met because of the weaving industry here in the northeast of Scotland. So um, they're based, they, they met each other in a town called Kirinir, which is currently like me here in Aberdeen being battered by Storm Babette just now. Um, and they met because um, through my through my dad's sister, my aunt, who was a friend of my mum's. And um, so I've always known that there was this connection with weaving um, in terms of how my parents met each other, but I didn't understand that it actually went any further back within our family until about um, maybe kind of seven years or so ago now, my mum started doing some family history research into her side of the family and she appeared one day with this massive kind of pedigree drawing going back seven generations, so back to 1841, which in Scotland is when the very first individual level population wide census took place. There had been parish records and various bits and pieces of information before then collected, but not systematically and not for everyone. And there's a real kind of preponderance to those who could hate to have information entered into the records being represented before that first census. Um, so as we started to look through these seven generations of the family, we could see that there were um, consistent weaving related trades that were appearing. And when you went through it systematically, it turns out that in every single one of those seven generations, there was somebody who had been involved with the weaving trade in one way or another. And then having kind of instantly, with my brain just instantly going to the, wow, weaving's in my DNA. It's, it's an inherited trait, it's genetics. I then started to dig into it a bit deeper and got really interested in the female line in the family. And when I started looking into this, and that's what's represented in the image here on the right hand side, is a very stylized version of the family tree. So at the very, this very kind of bottom yellow circle is me here and my two sons below that. And then above me is my mum and her brother, their mum and her siblings, and so on, all the way back to the very top, which is a great, 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 great grandmother all of the four mothers so the mum the mums of mums and when I started looking specifically at that line we could see that there was an almost unbroken line of women involved with weaving and um, some of them were weavers so myself and um, my grandmother um, was a power loom weaving operative before she was married her granny was also a weaver and great granny and the one at the very top was a was a winder, yarn winder, rather than a weaver herself, although all four of her children were weavers. And as you start to get back to that kind of top two and three generations, you see that actually all of them, you can see some of those examples on the left hand side that have been taken from um, national records, were all working with linen and um, brown linen predominantly. So they were making that really kind of coarse rough fabric that was being used for sacking and sailcloth. Um, and oftentimes um, big chunks of it being exported over to the former colonies to clothe enslaved peoples. So I got really interested then, first off in the fact that there was this kind of matrilineal um, inheritance. And the reason that really piqued my interest was because there, we kind of, we think about genetic information as being passed on from both parents to their children, which obviously it is, but there are also um, additional pieces of information that only mothers pass on to their children. So um, so that really piqued my interest. Um, all of the extra digging around that I did with um, to supplement the information that my mum had already found out was using Scotland's People, which is our national um, records set. Um, so this contains information from the 10 yearly censuses every year except um, 1941 during World War II um, and also births, marriages and death records and the occupations for um, all of the women and all of the people in the family that we looked at are available in various forms from these different pieces of information. 
the information that's collected on the census, um, as everywhere, has changed over time. But even since 1841, since the first one, occupation is something that has been recorded. And those occupations change a lot over the time, as you'll see, but we're looking predominantly at handloom weavers and um, brown linen weavers. And then as you get more recently, it transitioned to, um, to jute by the time of my, my grandmother and her mum. Um, and actually, linen weaving persisted in the northeast for much longer than it did in other parts of the UK. So it was really lovely to see this kind of um, kind of black and white information within the national records, but also within some of our own family records as well. The national records in Scotland are closed for the last one hundred years, so the most recent nineteen twenty one census was just made available in the last year, and that's the point at which we start to have information within the personal family record as well so it's been a really nice um, kind of way of merging things that are held within the family and this has become a really big family project actually and um, my mum and a lot of her cousins and her sibling have been coming together and pooling information that's become quite disparate within the family over the generations as as um, different bits of family archives were passed on to different people. So it's been a really lovely project, uh, pulling that together and really getting the family and um, kind of coalescing behind this whole idea of, of telling the story, particularly of these women, because so much of what we see in statistical accounts and records um, is written very much from the perspective of men doing the work. So actually it felt really important to acknowledge the, the labor and the care that these women were bringing into the family as well through their own economic activities. I mentioned briefly that um, I was really interested in these bits of DNA that mothers pass on to their children. So these are these are things that are um, little kind of circles of genetic information that are contained within parts of our cells called the mitochondria. Some of you may remember these from school as the, the powerhouses of the cell. And actually the idea that kind of mothers are powerhouses in transferring this information on between generations is also a bit of a theme that runs through the exhibition. One of the really interesting things about this particular piece of genetic information is, is that it is chunks of it are largely stable over long periods of time. Um, and when you when I sequence my bit of this genetic information, I'm actually sequencing information about my mum, her mum, and all of those four mothers back through 15,000, 50,000 years of history. And in doing so, we were able to identify that the kind of most common recent ancestor of everyone alive today who shares the same version of this genome that I do was probably living in and around the fertile present in what we today consider to be Turkey and Syria. Um, and they would have migrated um, as the ice started to recede, they would have migrated kind of along the Iberian Peninsula through southern Europe and up into the UK to Scotland. So again, that brought in a really interesting story where I have seven generations of women who are very clearly rooted here in the northeast of Scotland, but actually over the last 200 years, but actually take that back to tens of thousands of years ago and our family originated in a completely different part of the world. So it brings in those really kind of nice and interesting stories about what it means to be living in what is effectively a nation descended of immigrants. And again, that's a that's a that's a thread that runs through the exhibition and it runs through the way that the work is created as well. So these things about how the way that information flows between generations is represented within pieces of work. The genetic information itself is directly represented within the work. And then actually that um, kind of labor um, labor of economics and labor of care is also represented. So there are seven pieces of work in this exhibition, one for each of the seven generations within the family. Um, and there are panels that you can look at when you when you go to visit the physical exhibition, you will be able to see these and read them. They give you a bit more background information about each of the seven women um, and the specific piece of work that is associated with each one of them. Um, but there's also a little bit of text that goes with each one as well, just thinking through some of these ideas around um, who are we, where do we come from and how does it shape who we are today? And very much that idea of kind of seven generation thinking where 
the lived memory that exists within our family can take us here on the screen. I'm on the left hand side, Lynn, my mum and her generation, they can remember back as far as their great grandmother, Jessie. But the two Agneses at the right hand side, nobody who is alive today has any memory of them. What we know of them now sits within those public records and, and within some of the contemporaneous descriptions of how they were living and working at the time. So we have to start imagining a lot about who these women were, how they lived, how they worked. Um, and in fact, those ones kind of um, Jesse and the Agnes's were living in Kirinur, not far from where J.M. Barry, who you may know as the author of Peter Pan, was living with his own weaving father in a part of the town that um, Barry has also immortalised in some of his essays, um, notably the Tilly Loss Weavers. He talks about them as quite a rowdy bunch, and um, and I kind of imagine that some of some of their ferocity has also been passed on down through the generation, or at least I hope it has. Here's just some pictures of the work that's in the exhibition. Hopefully, some of you will be able to make it to Prony and actually see this for yourself in real life. If you are able to, I would recommend it absolutely. Um, I would say that I'm biased, obviously. Um, but being able to get in and kind of get up close with the work and to find out more about each piece is invaluable. Um, however, all of the works that are within the exhibition have also all been scanned digitally and 3D versions of them created. And it is possible for you, if you can't get to the physical exhibition, or even if you can, you can still visit and experience this exhibition online. If you head to my website, and I will pop this link into the chat when I stop talking um, to make it easy for you all to find, you can, on your laptop, on your smartphone, you can get in and you can see all of those same information panels and you can see kind of moving representations of all of the work, find out more about it. There are kind of images taken from the first place that the work was presented. And then I would say only on a laptop, don't try this on your phone. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, there is a second room that you can go in, that nice little brown door that you can see the wooden form house door in the wall there, you can walk through that door and it will take you into the second space that is actually much kind of higher resolution images of the work set up largely as they are within the exhibition at Pony just now. Um, and you can actually kind of walk through and around and interact with these objects online in a way that you're not able to do when you're in the physical exhibition. And you can also change the context that they appear in here. But in this image, you can see them kind of sitting on a, on a rocky beachfront, but you can you can see how these might look if you were um, imagining them in different places in the world. Um, so please do go and do that. The, both of these exhibition spaces, if any of you do have access also to a VR headset, then you can actually enter them as a kind of an, an immersive, almost as if you're within the room and all of these things are appearing around about you as well, which is also a really fun experience and a nice way to, to interact with the work. Um, but there's a real focus within this. So all of the materials that I have worked with um, are predominantly flax, linen, and jute. The objects that I've made themselves are really thinking through some of the ideas of what these women were doing. So the one that you can see on the screen there that I showed you a rotating image of, of making money, is thinking about the fact that very much these women were economically contributing to their families. This was not a, this was not a context. These weaving families are not ones where the men were out earning money and the women were at home looking after the kids. Everybody was working within the family, and in fact, often the kids would be involved with the with the loom set up as well. The house form that you've seen a couple of times called roofs over our heads. So again, it's the idea that the labour of the family and the fabrics that they were weaving are the things that were keeping a roof over their head. And that house form is interesting. Um, the way that weaving cottages worked within the small time where my family worked was that the family would live upstairs and the downstairs would be the, um, the weaving room. So that house structure is actually representing very typical um, forms of those houses within the, within the little red town um, and are deliberately referencing a loom as well. So you've got those two cylindrical bars where the warp is running from the from one side over the roof of the house to the other. 
with the woven fabric forming the roof in one of the walls and the unwoven warp at the other. When you go into the digital space as well, there are also, if you can see these little wall things here, there are also kind of recorded audio narratives. So even if you're visiting the physical exhibition, you can also on your phone kind of listen in and there's a bit of an audio tour as you walk around the exhibition space as well. So again, it gives you more information about the people that inspired each work and the, um, and the materials that have been used, the object that has been created. Um, and very much the, with that emphasis on thinking through the role for um, the, what my ancestors were weaving and being myself very mindful of the fact that the way that they were weaving and the purposes for which they were weaving and the way they were being compensated for their weaving is very different from my kind of more much more contemporary art practice. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and... Um, Hopefully I've whetted your appetite. I didn't really want to kind of do the full walkthrough today because I would like to encourage you to go and interact either with the physical expression and or with the digital version of it itself. But just to say a massive thank you to, um, to the funders that have been involved in making this collection possible um, and to the Linen Biennale and Prony for allowing me to present it in this new context in Ireland. I am going to be back in Belfast uh, from the middle of next week until the end of the month. So if there's anyone who's around and would like to meet with me, I'd love to come and have a coffee or catch up with anyone that's interested in textiles, linen, weaving, kind of social histories, uh, archives, uh, any and all of the above. So please do get in shout. Get in shout. Give me a shout. Get in touch. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lynn. Um, <clears throat> that's wonderful. Uh, I've I found the the exhibition very absorbing myself, and uh, the virtual exhibition that you're talking about sounds very intriguing. I'm I'm looking forward to having a look at that. Um, I'll more than a look at it. Uh, so, okay, I'll start. Um, I I'm I'm not sure if Dr. Catherine O'Hara will be able to do the talk this evening, but we're, we'll, we'll see after I uh, do a talk. Um, I'm going to now launch the uh, Prony Textile Guide. Uh, I'm going to share screen. And um, I hope this all works OK. Um, Okay, is that? That's it, uh, yes, yeah. Excellent, okay. Um, now, um, we wanted, as I say, uh, Lynn's um, exhibition was wonderful and we're trying to do something as well to, 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 to do our bit. Um, now, uh, what we, the, back in the, we, we started, Prony was founded in uh, 1922, 23, and this is the centenary of Prony. Um, we started building up a massive business record collection in the 1950s. And um, a good proportion of those business records were linen and textiles records. Uh, obviously, linen is such a big part of Ulster life. Um, and we brought out, uh, Michael Bottomley brought out um, a, a, an edition, the first edition of this textile guide in 1978. Um, however, the linen industry changed enormously in character during the 1980s. And it, uh, I suppose, the massive employment that existed in linen and textiles uh, ceased in the early 1990s in Northern Ireland. And a great number of the big firms changed their structure of production uh, and uh, started depositing records, uh, another large tranche of records in Prony. So that um, we thought it would be a good idea to have a hugely updated edition of the textile guide. Um, it's double in size uh, and uh, I think you'll see that it's very worthwhile. Now, uh, I'm going to start this 
going to go through this talk. I'm going to show you how to get the where the, where the pony guide is located. I'm going to talk you through the, the textile guide. Then I'm going to quickly describe the linen industry from the 1630s to 1990s. That's just the general character. And then I'm going to use various, um, a few different um, manuscripts in the guide to show three big phases of yarn and linen production in Ulster. And uh, this will kind of give you a sense of what's available in the guide and how it can be used. So where is the guide? Um, you go onto the website and you'll see the uh, website address down below. And this is what you'll see when you go onto the website. And if you go to resources and learning on the right hand side there, click on resources and learning. Um, and then you get this list of um, resources here at the very bottom. It's in alphabetical order is the Ulster textile industry. Um, and uh, it'll be one of the popular ones. You can see the popular ones on the right hand side. It's soon going to be one of the popular ones, I hope. Um, and uh, click on the Ulster textile industry. You'll come into this page and it'll give you a quick summary of um, the background to the guide. Then click on the um, the Ulster textile industry highlighted there in, in this page. And you'll get into this page and then finally click on the PDF and you're going to be straight into the Ulster textile industry, the the, um, the PDF itself. It's about 130 pages, 35 pages long. Uh, this is a, a lovely image of the island spinning uh, mill in Lisburn. It's a beautiful poster from the 1890s and it gives a great sense of the place of linen and um these little, they were like worlds in themselves, uh, what they were like uh, by the late 19th century and right up until the middle of the 20th century. Um, I think some of these buildings are still there. Uh, they, it's a beautiful little thing. Um, now, this is the shape of the book. Uh, there's a little introduction and foreword, but it's divided into two parts, essentially. There's a list of sources in alphabetical order on the linen industry. That's flax production, yarn production, um, the agricultural side of flax production and linen weaving, fine linen weaving and relatively coarse linen weaving. And then the textile industries. And that's, um, that's really um, cotton, woolens, and also um, production of um, clothes. So shirts, uh, all kinds of clothes. Um, and retail. So, and that's also in alphabetical order. Uh, so it's it's more or less in this. It's it's in the, the actual guide itself is laid out in this form. It's in alphabetical order, and um, you can see here the big one on this page is the the Ona Cork Mill, Belfast Flax and Jute Company, a really famous mill, uh, and it's broken down. Um, uh, as a summary. So it, it doesn't, it's a condensed version of what's on the catalog. If you look at this, you'll get a good idea of what we hold and hopefully it'll give you a good sense of direction. But once you go on to the catalog, you could get some, you'll get an awful lot more detail and uh, further guidance. We couldn't put the entire catalog into a, a guide like this, um, but the guide will direct you to the catalog. Um, uh, so you can you can get a good picture there of the sort of sources there we have that um, social historians can use and economic historians and uh, genealogical historians as well. Um, now, the major I'm sure everybody watching this has uh, the name of some of the big firms in their head. I just took a, a quick list of the firms of some big firms from it. It's not exhaustive, but you can see there Andrews, the Belfast Flax and Jute Company, the Blackstaff Flax Spinning uh, and Weaving Company Limited, the Braidwater Mill, Clark and Sons in Upperlands, um, the Cogri Linen Mill and Doak, uh, Greaves and Fourth River Mills, Herdman and Cyan Mills, the Island Spinning Company in Lisburn, the Old Bleach Linen Company, Stevenson's and Sons in Dungannon and the York Street flax spinning uh, mill, one of the biggest in the world in 1900. Uh, you'll see on the side there, those are the key um, references uh, for the uh, records that we hold. Where you see etc, that usually means that uh, there may be a 
the, the deposits came in in several tranches. So the first tranche will be the reference you see there, but there could be two or three other tranches. And uh, those tranches will be listed in the uh, textile guide. So you'll get a good idea of where to go. Um, now, linen industry itself, it's part of Ulster since the 6th to 17th century. We have, well, it goes back to the 1630s. There's a lot of linen yarn going to Lancashire. 1660s, 1670s, there's a big immigration of Northern English settlers. And the linen trade, you could say that a linen weaving community, as opposed to a yarn spinning community, was established by the 1680s. And it was notable and it was very much in the north of Ireland. It's not fully understood uh, why the north of Ireland became the centre of the trade. There's different conjectures about that, but it's not fully understood yet. Um, the key thing that actually um, kicked off the linen trade is probably the abolition of import duties. Uh, the export of linen to England, which was its main market, was um, penalised by import duties until 1696. And Irish linen couldn't really compete with European linen. Or that's when... Um, European linen, uh, there was duties put on European linen and uh, the duties on Irish linen were was abolished. And that's when it really began to take off. It was believed that the Huguenots were important, but historians are sceptical about that now. The Irish Linen Board was founded in 1711. Again, historians are more sceptical now that this was the big thing. You can see that linen cloth was substantial, but quite small in 1712, one and a half million yards, mostly to England. Uh, by the end of the century, it was 40 million yards. So during the century, it was mainly a low, it was just cottage industry, um, weaving and um, yarn production. Uh, there were no factories. Factories began in Ulster in the 1820s. Now, the key reason they would have begun in England and Scotland in the 1780s but it didn't. It was 40 years later in Ulster. And the key reason was it was actually cheaper to um, use the production of yarn by women at that stage, nearly all women. Uh, power looms uh, and weaving power looms were introduced in Ulster in the 1850s. And again, for the same reason, this was about 30 or 40 years after the rest of the British Isles. But the key reason was the fact that wages for weavers were very low, was very low in um Ulster, and it was just as cheap. It was to uh, to rely on uh, cottage weaving. By 1900, 200 major Ulster firms, 70,000 people employed, and 644 million miles of yarn produced, uh, and one of the, some of the biggest um, producers in the world. 1950s, the huge trend where you get synthetic yarns. Now that's the overall thing, and you see these. Uh, these are the features that are you see in if if, if you go through the uh, guide chronologically. I'm going to pick out various examples um, just to show you the three key phases. The first phase was the phase in which the, the industry was essentially a cottage industry. You had weavers working on small plots of land, sometimes growing their own flax, sometimes purchasing or growing their own flax from their own seed, but generally growing their own flax and uh, spinning their, their, the women folk spinning the yarn and uh, the men folk producing the weaving. There was a very much a strict um, kind of gender category in uh, categorization in um, employment at that stage. And they brought their linens to market and linen drapers and bleachers purchased the linen webs and um, these were coarse brown linens and bleached them and then sold them on to Dublin and then they were sold to England. And here's a, some of the early stuff. This is Thomas Greer Don Gannon and a beautiful little market book for brown linens um, that we have. Uh, and there's the reference number for the middle of the 18th century. And here's one of the pages and it shows a list of the weavers that he purchased the webs from. So this is a gorgeous um, example. And, and if you kind of go through the whole book, you can get a really good sense of how the marketing of linen worked. Uh, there's a nice little thing here. Uh, the linen 
markets were set up in in, in uh, nearly all the big towns. The linen weavers went to the town, went to a stand where there were, where there were the drapers, the merchants, and this happened very fast. The whole thing was done really quickly, and um, uh, as you can see there, um, the cloth is just marked. And the peasant, as it says, that's the weaver, goes to an office for payment. Um, so that's how it worked in the markets. Here's another little thing. This is the late 18th century showing uh, the sale of woolen goods. The big thing that happened during the 18th century was that at the start of the, late, of the 18th century, most textile production in Ireland was really woolens. And uh, woolens occupied a big part of the um, share of export trade. By the end of the 18th century, 60 to 70 percent of the Irish linen trade was textile, was linens, and woolens had reduced. But we have some lovely, this is a nice Little, it looks like a little exercise book, um, and it's fascinating to think this is mid 18th century, and he's selling woolen goods, and these are his um, little notes, how much he sold to different people, and um, the cost of the goods. Uh, it's part of it is like code. It takes a little bit of work to figure out what's happening. Now, as I said, the um, wet spinning. The, the first machinery that came into textile production was machinery for the spinning of yarn. Uh, this happened in Scotland and England in the late 18th century. It didn't begin to happen until the late 1820s, early 1830s in Ulster, essentially because it was cheaper to buy the yarn from uh, women at market who were selling the yarn. Um, uh, and that's essentially why they did it. Uh, they began to introduce this in the early, uh, late 1820s, 1830s, and you can see how simple the factories were. Um, now, by the mid to late 19th century, these are the kind of concerns. As I say, everything was centralised. Every part of the bleaching and um, linen production business was centralised in one massive unit. And... Um, there's a kind of a utopian sense of uh, what it was like in those units. But one of the key things to remember when you see this is that although production was very successful in the north of Ireland and great fortunes were made and employment was provided, the employment was very poorly paid and um, it involved quite a deal of social discipline. And uh, I'm just going to pick out a couple of things. You can almost sense the social discipline looking at uh, for the the ordinary employees when you look at these buildings, um, because you can see the tiny windows and you can imagine that everyone is regulated and uh, the discipline is enforced within these. Uh, they look like warehouses for people in a sense. Uh, and this was very new in Ireland in the 1830s and 1840s. Here's regulations for the workforce, Charlie and Company, Seymour Hill, Antrim. Very big, very big difference from the 18th century where people worked as independent um, producers and went to market and uh, dealt with the purchasers. In this case, you were in a factory and you had to obey factory discipline. And uh, you can see there a little extract, any act of mischief in any form shall be punished by fine or dismissal quite punitive discipline. The only way to deal with that was to form trade unions and uh, or associations. And here's an example from our records of an association formed uh, in Waringstown, as it happens, uh, which was a center for fine weaving. <clears throat> and as the, you can see there, the, uh, the little verse on the front of the page, society is the only plan to maintain the rights of man. Um, and here is an image. There are we have a, a a great selection of photos taken by the factory owners in the 1890s and early 1900s, celebrating in different photographic albums the their, the success of the different firms. And um, there's one lovely photographic album by Campbell and Company in Mosley Mills, and this shows the kind of um, the complexity of the machinery. Uh, that uh, women were working um, because the bulk of the labor force was actually still women. Um, but they were working in family in, in the factories and uh, their wages were lower than the wages of men. Um, and 
it was actually quite dangerous work. You can see the complexity of the machinery. Now, by the late 19th century, you had societies forming to try and protect workers and the, uh, unions being formed. And you also had state uh, regulation. Um, but the state regulation did tend to be pro-management, you could say. And in this particular instance, it's quite interesting. This is from a, a factory inspection report, again, from our records. Now, I'm just taking a particular perspective just to show you the different phases of um, uh, uh, of the textile trade in Ulster and um, how things changed. Uh, um, Numerous minor accidents have occurred to women workers in the factory. The machinery is not sufficiently fenced. According to the managers, the accidents are due to disobedience on the part of the women workers cleaning the machinery while it's working. Now, the suggestion to stop this is by issuing an act not to clean machinery in motion or it will be punishable by dismissal. Now, it doesn't take a genius to see that probably the managers were unwilling to stop the machinery and the only way the machinery could be cleaned would be if the people came in early and did it in their own time. I'd imagine that's the case. Now, the big difference by the by the 20th century, before the character of the whole business uh, began to change in the 1980s, was that um, until the early part of the 19th century of the 20th century, you had a great deal of export to Britain and to America and all over the world, but there was no retail uh, abroad. By the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, the big Ulster manufacturers had established their own retail outlets in England and in America. And here's a little, uh, the Walpole brothers who were based in Waringstown in Dublin, and they had a retail outlet in New York. And it's a nice little image of, um, and this is from their uh, records and it's a nice it just shows the way uh, retail was organized in New York from Ulster um, you also have to uh, the, the part of the the character of the third phase of textile production in uh, over the last couple of centuries is the fact that synthetic yarns begin to come into play um, and in this case you can see spun rayon is part of this shows the kind of cycle of production for the Moy Gashel group based in Dungannon, which was a whole set of um, companies selling clothes and producing textiles, producing cloth and uh, making clothes uh, in Ireland from the late 1950s until the 1980s. And it was a, a, a very, very important group of companies. Um, and this shows how Rayon begins to take uh, take part rayon is used in industrial production uh, and this is from a booklet advertising the moy gashel group in early 1960s in the 1961 now this is the walpole group again and this is 1958 and it's their shop in london and it's from the walpole uh, records this is inside the shop and it's just a nice image of um uh, what the shop looked like um late 1950s sophisticated for its time and then finally, um, at this stage, you had um, a, a considerable amount of state support for um, um, the retail of Irish linen abroad, both in America and in um, Europe and in Britain. And this is from there were exhibitions every couple of years in London and in uh, New York, and there was quite a bit of promotional material produced. And this is a, a, quite a nice, it reminds me of um, the kind of advertisement you get in women's magazines in the 1960s and 1970s. But it's a lovely um, kind of promotional poster by the Irish Linen Guild uh, promoting Irish linen. Uh, in 1961, this is dated to. Um, this is the, so it's essentially with the um, advent of consumer societies. So uh, retailers, these are for the big um, retail stores in the different um, big cities and then smaller towns. So this is kind of a quick overview of the uh, textile guide. Um, I hope it shows you where you can get it and gives you a sense of how productive it should be. Um, I'll, I'll finish there and uh, I hope that 
uh, is, a, is, is, is a stimulus to looking at it. Okay. Um, so the linen trade, you know, I think Des and, you know, Lynn, uh, you know, have very generously alluded to this um, this evening. And uh, we're all familiar with, the, you know, the, the industry's, uh, you know, once premier um, uh, space within within trade and business history and so on. Um, it had an illustrious history um, and with that brought uh, outstanding scholarship. Uh, much of the literature has concentrated on the economic, political and social contributions the industry made. And while these histories tell important stories about the significance of the industry, um, they also serve to highlight gaps in our linen knowledge, especially around creative production. So after flax production and before linen weaving, proto-industrialization or otherwise takes place, design and designing is undertaken. Uh, this fundamental stage at the start of the textile process is all too often overlooked. My research focuses on design uh, for industry, um, and this paper reviews the range of resources that I have drawn upon at Prony uh, that can help us better understand design in this fabled industry. So my background is in design history, and I'm interested in the intersection of the role of design in industry, its cultural and professional status, design reform and design education. In the mid 1990s, I became aware of the Old Bleach Linen Company. And, um, you know, it was really through a number of articles and books on 20th century textiles. These sources tended to emanate from museum collections in England, such as the VNA and the City Art Gallery in Manchester. The company were regularly mentioned among a stable of well-known English and Scottish progressive textile manufacturers who were pioneering in modern design or technical innovation. Yet further inquiry uh, yielded uh, very little. My curiosity had to be sated. Uh, I embarked upon a PhD um, and as we all stand on the shoulders um, of giants, I learned of Prony through footnotes and references from other historians. I spent many days, nay months, in Prony, um, initially focused on the Old Bleach uh, Linen Company, um, but it became clear that the company's network, um, like many textile businesses um, here, um, uh, spread far and uh, wide. In Prony, I have drawn upon mainly primary source material um, comprised of, um, I suppose, really business records and uh, government um, papers, um, such as the Ministry um, of commerce uh, papers. And you can see here these uh, columns, you know, these column papers are um, myriad and endless. So you have to use kind of techniques like, um, you know, limiters and so on, and um, to try and find um, you know, precisely what you're looking for, um, which is always quite hazardous because sometimes you don't know what you're looking for. Um, so uh, further Ministry of Commerce, Linen and Textile Company records were invaluable um, to uh, my research as well. Um, as a design historian, um, I use a combination of primary and secondary sources. However, I want to see and use historical uh, sources in their original um, format. Wendy Duff argues original materials are the best stimulus to the historical imagination. My main rationale for archival research is deeply connected to how design historians critically locate and read the original artifact. In relation to textiles, uh, texture, thread count, warping of yarn, weight, cloth structure and cloth handle may well be of the utmost importance to how we better understand its design and production. In archives like Prony, where the artifacts are less common and um, but sometimes evident, there is still substantive information on how a cloth was produced. There is no doubt much of my research of Prony was largely contextual in nature. In order to investigate design practices in Ulster's interwar linen industry, I had to establish a broad understanding of the contemporary condition of the industry. So, so government records, as I've mentioned, um, you know, are these really quite um, uh, they're, they're kind of they are reliable, but they um, but they do offer um, a, a myriad kind of complexity um, of what even then was recognised as an industry in sharp decline. Um, so on the left here we have a, a memorandum which was uh, on a scheme of amalgamation um, from 1929, um, which was recommending that um, I suppose really the the industry had to rationalise in order to um, uh, confront. 
uh, the challenges and opportunities um, within you know, the industry. So on the right here, we have um, a Chamber of Commerce uh, journal um, that there are no tariff barriers, um, which kind of sounded uh, a little familiar um, to the kind of rhetoric um, from today, uh, post-Brexit. Um, but so, I mean, that was, well, not quite a hundred years ago, but quite some time ago that this, the similar um, issues were being faced, uh, uh, were being faced. The Ministry of Commerce records are, uh, for me, indispensable in revealing the machinations of a once huge industry. The energetic measures taken to consolidate the industry seemed endlessly invented, inventive and generally fraught with large and small um, difficulties. So no doubt the um, the kind of um, resources I was looking at was um, things like um, industry fairs, trade fairs. Um, I was also looking at things like the Scottish Empire exhibition, um, the Northern Ireland ex exhibit on uh, linen, which itself was fraught um, with, um, I suppose, micro uh, micro dramas. Um, so in this um, particular instant, um, uh, you know, one of the um, secretaries of the of the uh, committee um, had learned that um, the old bleach had been giving out um, uh, samples. Now, useful to me in the sense that this was the first time I was able to actually see um, a brochure um, from the company um, for one of their uh, ranges of um, uh, furnishing fabrics. So, so these folders are useful in um, not so not so obvious ways because you see how the companies or the linen companies here were being promoted and being. Um, you know, uh, reaching out uh, across, uh, you know, across the globe. Um, price lists too um, have been um, invaluable. Um, they are an, a rich source of data on, on the variety, volume, qualities, and most relevant to my research patterns um, that Ulster linen companies were producing um, to satisfy uh, local, uh, sorry, global, um, global markets. Um, things like scrapbooks um, also are um, this kind of uncontained joy. They tend not to have, they might have a unifying um, purpose, but they tend to be full of, of quite um, uh, idiosyncratic um, inclusions and, and a joy to uh, review. Um, so we have a, uh, one here on the left uh, with press cuttings from 1910 to 43, and then on the right, um, a price list from uh, W.J. Strain with hand rendered uh, monograms. So there's this very direct um, uh, relationship with uh, first-hand material. The researcher is always grateful to the enthusiastic epistolar. Uh, WH Webb, who was the chairman of Old Bleach, um, was um, indefatigable in letter writing and um, he lobbied many circles, um, not only on behalf of his own firm, but also the wider uh, linen trade. Um, on the left is a series of um, letters to Sir James Craig. One, I think, reached something like 15 pages uh, long. Uh, in this case, in 1921, he conveyed the general pessimism felt by the linen industry, although took a more optimistic approach, suggesting rationalisation. He said, I run my place in the American system, which may be described as the German system humanised. And then on the right is... Uh, a series of many letters uh, between WH Webb and Lady Londonry um, on again uh, lobbying her support um, of the, the linen industry. So uh, she was quite a kind of significant um, figure in the linen industry and um, Certainly, I'll kind of talk about her in, in a moment. Um, but the Chamber, um, Belfast Chamber of Commerce uh, journal held at Prony is also um, invaluable um, in uh, on the linen network. So, for example, on the left, you see um, the the composition of the, the council of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and you can actually see that that network and those names that kind of reappear and reiterate right across uh, the trade through associations and and organs and so on. Um, and and then on the right, it also comprised um, articles that um, described the um, the importance of um, design, design trends, and being uh, market savvy. Um, and these were some of the covers from the nineteen thirties um, that the that the Old Bleach Linen Company had um, paid, I think, for about over a year um, for the cover um, cover designs, which outlined their um, fast fat dyes and their um, furnishing fabric. Um, uh, range.
Okay. Um, so Lady Londonry's um, role in the support of the linen industry is quite interesting. And there is a lovely um, file of her um, her uh, correspondence between um, the Old Bleach Linen Company and um, in the organisation of the dress exhibition um, at her London home in Park Lane in, in 1935. And this is just a draft um, of one of um, uh, her, her letters um, to, uh, to WH Webb at the Old Bleach. Um, what's kind of important here is about really um, these letters revealing a whole range of kind of, you know, um, da data and, uh, you know, intelligence, I suppose, about, um, about her network, about her influence. Um, her support of the industry, um, her very direct style of communication. I mean, she did not beat about the bush. It was, it was wonderful um, and um, slightly puerile to kind of, you know, read such kind of intimate um, intimate letters. Um, but also Gabrielle Chanel's business um, acumen and her efforts to protect her own market and position um, that she was being approached by uh, Lady Londonry to contribute to the dress exhibition. Um, and uh, But, you know, Chanel, who had a reputation for being, you know, uh, a little tricky um, and alpha, in a sense, um, decided in the end not to take part uh, in the exhibition. So uh, Prony also holds um, uh, an example of the invitation, uh, which outlines, you know, the, the, the mannequins and models that were used um, during the exhibition. And um, you can see that just to the left. And then on the right are just some pieces from press cuttings um, from the event itself. Um, so in colour, you see at the top of the middle uh, image. Um, in Vogue um, from 19, uh, February 1935, and then on right, um, Birmingham Post, um, the bridal gown that's you know, kind of traditionally left uh, towards the end for the, the, the grand finale. So it was viewed as a good success. Um, uh, economically, again, it was uh, probably quite modest in those terms, but there was very much a sense that um, the, the linen industry was kind of reaching into new dress linen markets that they had somewhat neglected um, uh, before. So um, what's quite interesting about this is um, uh, this is a Chanel registered design um, by the Old Bleach, uh, so dress linen um, that they had produced for Chanel design. This is um, from 1933, so it precedes um, the dress exhibition in 1935. Um, there is every likelihood, although I haven't been able to find evidence yet, um, that um, uh, Lady Londonderry would have, would have introduced just the two so that you know either Chanel to Old Bleach or Old Bleach to Chanel and um, you know I, I think there was a a, a a relationship there of sorts um, but it's very difficult to kind of get, you know get beyond um, that and that's the the uh, the linen that was produced by Old Bleach um, and on the left hand side is the the, the sample fabric of the the Board of Trade um, design registers um, at the National Archives in Kew. So what archival research can do, and certainly I did find this with Prony, is that um, it leads you on to other archives. It can kind of push you into you know other libraries and archives. So in that sense, they are very much not one-stop shops or cul-de-sacs for research that they um, open, I suppose, are openers of, of doors. Um, and these are um, some linen pieces uh, by Old Bleach um, held at London, uh, Lady Londonderry's um, Northern Ireland home, Mount Stewart, um, in the archives. Um, the one on the right, well, the one on the left, I've never been able to name, but the one on the right is called Sparon and was one of the first um, fabrics, one of the, the early furnishing fabrics um, that the Old Bleach had introduced in the early 1930s um, and was uh, bought by the V&A um, to add to their uh, to their collection. Um, so, so there is a kind of, you know, a really a quite interesting history um, between those archives, those kind of, you know, I suppose almost like my, mycelium um, kind of uh, tendrils that connect um, archives um, together. So Prony, I was also finding really interesting stuff um, in designer forum and design education. Um, the Design and Industries Association um, had a printing exhibition in 1916, and they were really a, a nationwide um, effort to um, promote um, design reform through education, and um, in particular kind of concepts of good design and what good design might look like. Um, and the 19 
uh, 16 exhibition in Belfast was specifically about uh, printing and design and workmanship. And um, Prony has uh, a really quite lovely um, folder on that particular exhibition, the organisation of its curation and, and selection uh, and so on. Um, it didn't really have its own chapter. The DIA didn't have its own chapter in Northern Ireland, um, which I think was um, certainly uh, a bit of an absence, um, but but certainly um, there was th that there is evidence, um, you know, held within Prony. I think is is quite quite good to see that design reform efforts were being made. Um, I was also very interested in um, the Ministry of Education um, papers, uh, and this is um, from uh, um, an inquiry into the present position of industrial art in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm not sure if you can all read that, but um, the, the statement from the principal of the technical school in Antrim had said the old bleach linen company of Randallstown uh, is the main firm, the textile industry in this area. And I understand that the designers employed by this firm are highly skilled and have received long training at the Royal College of Art London or a similar College of Art. That would have been the Slade um, School of Fine Art. Um, some time ago, I was informed by a director of the company that there would be no benefit derived by the company or its employees if classes in industrial design were um, were uh, to be established. Um, and what's kind of interesting about that is that there was a sense that um, the it was very much in house with the with the company, and there was a kind of control within that about how we understand that um, that thinking. And um, he went on to say um, that most of the so called designers in the textile factories are mainly engaged in copying designs prepared by the artists. What's really interesting about that is a distinction between what designers do and what artists do. So designers are uh, drafts men or women, um, and artists are the the source of of creativity. Another piece from um, the uh, Ministry of Education was a scheme for competitions for textile designs between the industry associations and the Ministry of Education. Um, unfortunately, it only lasted for two years. Um, uh, I think some of the designs in 1929 were deemed successful, if not um, technically geared for industrial production. Um, and then in 1930, the designs submitted were again not wholly satisfactory due to the failure of the competitors to understand fully the requirements of the industry. I think what's interesting about that is that the um, the competitors are somewhat blamed um, rather than perhaps um, the education or the industry, the trade itself. And that kind of um, spat or controversy continued um, for some time uh, throughout the 1930s. Um, this is a Prospectus of day courses um, from 1939 um, to 40 um, from uh, Belfast College of Art. And again, you can kind of see just evidence of um, you know, textile production and, and the kind of um, style, I suppose, of the period. Um, um, well, this is a kind of little, um, I suppose, uh, a sense of uh, I was very interested in art industrial art committee. Um, and it comprised 20 meetings um, and 15 witness statements, a digest of evidence and a full report. It was a lot. A lot of documents were scribed by hand before photography for personal research. It's permitted um, at Prony. I'm not really sure if my, my writing hand has ever um, has ever really recovered. But the silver lining is a series of notebooks that chart both the research journey and a compact in, uh, insight into design reform in Northern Irish education and uh, industry. And I'm actually just go, uh, going to finish off tonight. I think I've got about a minute left. Um, so I want to talk about accidentally found on purpose material and um, which enriches the narratives around the, the linen industry. Well, this is um, a first, uh, really first pre first World War material. It is an artifact of great interest to me, and um, given the paucity of surviving uh, textile sample and pattern books uh, in Northern Ireland, this is a brown paper parcel comprising design sheets uh, for various printed patterns for handkerchiefs used by um, Strain and Elliot, later W. J. Strain, um, uh, of Glen Print Works in Newton Ard, Ulster Print Works, Crawford Print Works in Dunmurray. And the outstanding um, artwork um, uh, shows a taste of bygone uh, uh, product. So I'm just going to race through these in my last in my last 26 seconds. And um, we can just see some of the artwork all hand rendered and hand painted for uh, pattern cards for hand um, handkerchief production. Um, the Glen 
print works and um, we can see if you look at the top right and the bottom left and um, we can see instructions from the senior designer or the head of design to have white between black and blue two blues as one color on lines across corner um, so these primary sources um, have punched name cards which offer provenance so in other words glenn print works marginalia provide invaluable insight into the design process and artwork provides detail in pattern creation and design evolution and my last Last slide um, is the rarely spotted textile artifact in Prony. In this fragment, an example of design translation into cloth. Prony holds a rich and unexpected trove of Ulster's linen history and enticing glimpses of its design story. Thank you.